Good morning. Uh, I am Craig Tucker. I have a long history working for the university, Mississippi State University, and I work for USDA now. Most of my work over the years has been on environmental issues, but mainly inside the culture system. In other words, keeping the culture system in a very clean state so that the fish grow well. And starting in about the 1990s, I started working on outside the system. What are some of our impacts on outside the system? And I've given a number of these presentations, um, usually much longer than this. This is an extremely complicated subject, as I'll, as I'll mention here in a minute. Uh, there are semester long and two semester long courses at universities that cover these issues, and dozens and dozens of books that have been written on it. Part of the difficulty is the diversity. We normally think of agriculture as being a very diverse undertaking, and, and it is. Um, there's quite a few plant species that are raised in the, in the world that contribute to what we eat. 30 plant species make up about 95% of everything humans eat globally, but only four of those represent about 75% of all the consumption of the, of the plants that, that we eat. Same thing with animal species. Um, quite, a few, quite a few different animals are, are raised for food in the world, but really only a very few make up roughly 75% of the food we eat. This is in contrast with aquaculture globally. Right now, there are over 600 species of aquatic plants and animals that are raised in aquaculture. Uh, extraordinarily diverse. This will change over time as consolidation and, and food taste and so on change. But even at that, right now, there's 35 species that, when, that we would consider dominant. In other words, there's extremely significant production of a huge number of animals. And Jim Parsons went over some of this. Um, there are microorganisms that are raised, microalgae. These are raised for food and fuel. Um, spirulina is a, a health uh, additive that uh, you can buy in any, 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 any drug store. Um, there's a lot of algae being grown for biofuels. You see, you see um, advertisements on TV by Exxon say, uh, the future is gonna be biofuels from algae. Um, Seaweeds has already been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, shellfish of many kinds, crustaceans of, of several times, several kinds, and of course fish. And these fish include not only food fish has been mentioned, but Jim also mentioned bait fish and ornamental fish. So there's this extraordinarily extraordinarily diverse number of animals that are raised. But what really sets aquaculture apart in terms of looking at the environmental impacts of aquaculture is this amazingly diverse array of culture systems and environments in which we try to raise these animals. This is an inshore, shelf, uh, inshore seafood or uh, seaweed farm. Um, shellfish, it's already been mentioned, there's been several pictures of shellfish. Inland ponds make up most of aquaculture in the world. Raceways, race to race trout, say, and other, other animals where water flows in, the fish are put in, and the water flows out. Completely indoor systems have already been mentioned too. Net pens that are placed in near shore areas that hold the fish in, in, in relatively protected near shore areas. And then really fantastical offshore caged fish farms that the projections are just these vast underwater farms of cages holding fish. Each and every one of these species and each and every one of these different culture systems has a different set of resource requirements and a different sort and uh, a different array of impacts on the environment. And so going through each one of them is, is an impossible task even for several books. To simplify things, I'm gonna make two generalizations about resource use. Sort of give you a general idea of where we are with respect to resource use compared to other animals. Then I'm gonna use two examples from our two largest sectors of aquaculture about environmental impacts, give you some idea where we are. Some of this has already been mentioned by uh, both Jim and Carol. This is normally, the, the first generalization I'm gonna make has to do with where we get the food to raise the animal or plant. Uh, what is the food source for growth? This is normally what we think of when we think of aquaculture. Uh, Resources are brought in from outside, formulated into feeds, 
and then fed to the fish. This is, uh, you know, a, a good term for this is just fed aquaculture. But there's this whole other aspect of it that several people, again, have mentioned already, and we generally call this extractive aquaculture. And it's called extractive because we're actually using materials from in the environment that are extracted into the animal or plant and are used for growth. This happens to be seaweed. Uh, seaweeds grow by taking potential pollutants, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon dioxide, from out of the environment and temporarily sequestering them inside their, inside their tissue. In other words, they're removing potential pollutants into a useful, sometimes edible, but for pharmaceuticals and so forth product. So that's extracting these uh, growth factors into a product. Shellfish is the classic example. We normally, uh, unless you know a little bit about how shellfish eat, this might be a little bit strange to you. But what they do is they take water that has phytoplankton in it, very small micro, particulate microorganisms. They filter it through their shell, through what's, uh, through essentially their gills, and they extract from that phytoplankton and other plants that they use for growth. So they take in suspended matter and they excrete clean water. The Nature Conservancy put out a series of slides that show some of the advantages of shellfish aquaculture. These are really instructive. I always like using slides from environmental organizations when I talk about these things. First of all, I just mentioned this. Oysters equal clean water. They have an example of one oyster will filter 50 gallons of water a day. In other words, they're going to clean 50 gallons of water a day by taking the, the particulate matter out of there. Um, someone Artie mentioned, Carol, I guess it was Artie mentioned, or no, it was Angie. Artie mentioned, uh, you know, the, the usefulness of, of shellfish aquaculture for coastal renovation. Uh, shellfish reefs, uh, shellfish farming helps to dissipate wave energy and therefore uh, reduces erosions of shorelines. And of course, happy fishing when you make money. So there's an economic benefit to it too. Um, we have, we've already seen a, a short video of this, and so, uh, and we're gonna hear later a little bit more about shellfish aquaculture, so now I'm gonna turn back to fed aquaculture, which is what, I'm, which is what I know most about. Um, this is different in that the resources we use for growth are derived from outside. These are usually feed ingredients that are formulated into feed and then fed to the animal, and they're basically the same for terrestrial animals. And so uh, there's some comparisons here to how aquacultural animals rank compared to terrestrial animals. And this is extremely important because this has implications for all sorts of resource use down the line. I'm gonna use one specific example. Um, this is all related to how efficient fish are in converting, I think Jim mentioned this, how, how efficient fish are in converting food to flesh. Um, here's some terrestrial animals. Cattle just happen to be notorious for several reasons for being relatively inefficient, so on and so forth. Poultry are actually extraordinarily efficient. And so much work on diets and particularly the genetics of this animal that it's, uh, for a warm-blooded animal, it's just an amazingly efficient animal at taking feed and converting it to flesh. But here's two of our, two of our big products in the United States, catfish and trout equal to or better at converting food to flesh than these warm-blooded animals. And for, you know, if you have biology, you know what the reason for this is. They're cold-blooded animals. They don't, a lot of the energy that a warm-blooded animal takes in when it eats is used to just maintain body temperature. And of course, this varies depending on the temperature of the ambient environment. But a lot of energy is just spent in temperature regulating. The other thing is, fish float in the water. They don't have to spend a lot of energy trying to maintain their position in the, in the, against gravity in the environment. Uh, there's other reasons too, but the point here is, is that cold-blooded animals, fish in particular, just happen to be very, very efficient at converting feed into edible tissue. And again, this has implications for any number of things. I'm going to use land use. And when I speak of land use, in terms of uh, this particular issue. One, you know, the easiest thing to think of is just the facility. This is a bunch of ponds, so that's a land use. That's just the facility size. 
It could be a poultry house, it could be a feedlot, it could be whatever. So there's the facility. But all these animals, or most of them anyway, are raised on some sort of grain, grain product, uh, with soybean meal, corn, wheat, whatever it might be. And so there's a lot of land that's used just to raise these food crops that are put into feed. So that becomes part of the overall footprint of raising this animal, and that's important. Now again, fish are very efficient at converting feed into flesh. So when you look at land use, this is exactly what you would think would happen. Um, here's beef, here's swine, poultry, and catfish. It follows the exact same kind of pattern as just the feed efficiency, which makes sense that so much of the land used to raise these animals is used to raise the feed. There was a study done not too long ago by Hallie Froelich at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she took a, a, a good bit of data. There's some very interesting assumptions made on um, how uh, demographics will change in the future, how food choices will change in the future, how much more efficient we'll get raising both animals and plants and so on. But she took three scenarios and, and looked at them. The first was, here's just business as usual, and these are global numbers, these are not United States numbers. But about one billion metric tons of grains, feed products, are used to raise the animals that we eat. And they're divided up roughly the way I saw them. There were, there were also other animals in there that I just sort of, for simplicity of the graph, just threw them in there. And then the next scenario was looking at all of these changes that will occur in the next 30 years. Uh, what, how much feed, in other words, these grains, will be used to support the animal production in the world if everything just increases the same way. You know, we eat about the same proportion of beef and the same proportion of chicken and so forth. And it ends up being about 3 billion tons of feed crops will be used to support that animal production. And then they looked at what would happen if a substantial portion of that increase in meat production was taken up by raising aquaculture products. They made some assumptions in there that were sort of interesting about, you know, we will continue to eat certain things, eggs I think were one of them, and so forth, and also some changes again in efficiency of production. But they came up with, with that, whoops, let me go back there, with that, with that uh, comparison there. Um, about a little bit less than a third of the total grain production would be used in what they called an aquaculture dominant world. In other words, if all we did was to substitute aquatic products for the increase in meat, per, in, in, in meat consumption over the years. The final sentence, I think it was, in this publication was uh, pretty obvious. Just millions of acres of land would be spared in the world for other uses, say raising uh, grain products or vegetable products or whatever, if a substantial portion of human diets would switch to aquatic products. So um, it's a wise choice just in terms of where the future is going to be. This generalization of we're more efficient animals, the cold-blooded animals are more efficient at using food than warm-blooded animals. This corresponds also to changes in how efficient energy use is. In other words, we have that same sort of general trend with energy use per kilogram of animal produced, greenhouse gas emissions, and water use. So all of these resource inputs, which are mainly used to produce the feed that we use to grow these animals, are lower when you compare them to terrestrial animals. So it's a, it's a very efficient fish to raise. Um, the next, um, oh, using these, uh, I said I was gonna use a couple of specific examples on a completely changed topics now. Instead of resource use, I'm gonna look at impacts. And one of the, this is a, a publication by the Environmental Defense Fund in 1997. Um, they made an assessment of what they thought were some of the major impacts of U.S. aquaculture on the environment. One thing they focused in on very heavily was pollution. All animals that are raised in agriculture produce a waste. Uh, you, know, you feed the animal, the animal retains a certain portion of the feed, the nutrients in the feed, and the rest are excreted as waste. Fish are no different. Uh, aquatic animals are no different. 
and they really focused in on this one issue of the pollution issue. And actually, they strongly lobbied the Environmental uh, uh, Protection Agency, EPA, at that time. And, and EPA developed as uh, part of a rulemaking process uh, a law, a rule, uh, to limit aquacultural effluents. This was a five or six year project, and I, you know, there, there's probably a half dozen or more people in this room that were part of this process. It was very interesting, and somebody else has already picked up on this, is that there were a lot of misconceptions about what aquaculture really does. Uh, the people in EPA didn't know a lot about aquaculture, and the, the, the publication Murky Waters sort of painted with a very broad brush that led EPA to believe that aquaculture is a bad polluting industry. And um, what they found out was that this was not true. And I'm going to give two examples of here of exactly where we stand with respect to this one issue that became so important, which is pollution. I'm going to look at the two, uh, this has already been mentioned, the two largest aquaculture industries in the United States, along with mollusks, uh, catfish and, and trout. I'm going to start with catfish. Catfish are raised in northern ponds that don't really discharge except for periods of very heavy rainfall, primarily in the winter. In other words, they just capture rainfall. They're not drained for years at a time. So they're essentially just capturing rainfall over time. Very little discharge. And these are the major catfish producing in the industries. I'll just point out, I think that Carol did, if you look at these, these are some of the more economically depressed areas in the United States where catfish farming is a very important part of rural economic development. I'm gonna look at, uh, a particular area, this is the Mississippi Delta, this is where I live, this is in uh, northwest Mississippi, very flat, it's where most of the catfish are raised. I'm going to look at a small watershed in the southern delta, it's called the Wolf Lake Watershed. There's a lake down there that had become very polluted over time, and uh, EPA, the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality, and some university researchers became involved in looking at what are the pollutant contributors to this lake. And on the, uh, on the side there, you can see a, the approximate breakdown of the land use in that area. Most of it was in cropland, primarily soybeans. Uh, a good bit of it was still in native hardwood forests. Um, some of it in pastures, and a, a fair amount of it was in catfish ponds. And, you know, it's a rural area, so a little bit in residential. So they quantify the inputs of all these different pollutants that were going into Wolf Lake and saying, what are the major contributors to polluting that lake? This, this graph's a little bit bizarre. That, that dotted line in the middle, it, this is, it, it's really looking at the proportion based on the land use. That dotted line in the middle means that that's one. That means that uh, you're contributing pollution exactly in proportion to your land looks like. If you're, if you, if you represent a particular land use represents 25% of the land that's contributing 25% of the pollutants, anything above that dotted line means you're polluting in excess of what land you're using. It's on the other side less. But here's the way it, the way it ended up. Um, and I'm going to show you this graph. And the same thing, this is for phosphorus contribution, which is a major pollutant in most waters. What this means is you'll notice that catfish was at the bottom in the smallest little bar on the bottom of each of these. And row crops were at the top. Row crops, this is just erosion off the row crops. When it rains hard, it work, the erosion comes off. It contributes soil particles. Any of the phosphorus fertilizer that was put on the soil is washed into the streams and then into the lake. Catfish ponds were the, the lowest contributor of pollutants of any land use per acre in the, in the area. I had a, a person from Mississippi DEQ tell me that if the entire watershed was catfish ponds, that lake would revert back to a completely unpolluted state. In other words, it was by far the least polluting land use of anything on that watershed. Next I'll move to Idaho. This has already been mentioned. This is uh, trout country. And the little circle there is the Middle Snake River Valley where most, uh, about 70% of the trout in the United States are grown. This is a beautiful area. This is uh, a vacation destination, especially if you're a fish farmer and really want to see some interesting aquaculture. 
a very precious resource. There's, uh, the, the whole Snake River Valley is composed of volcanic rock. It's very porous, and so uh, snow melt on the mountains all around the, the Snake River Valley melt, seep into the ground, and then come gushing out of the sides of this canyon in these huge, beautiful springs. And quite a few of them are, they fall right out of the side of the mountain and they will go right through a trout farm and they used to raise trout. Um, this is a classic example. This is a, a, a sort of a large to medium sized trout farm on, in the Snake River Valley. That's the Snake River on the right. And you can see, I think, some of the springs that are coming out of the sides of the mountains there. They, whoops, go back. They fall out of the mountain. They run one time through these raceways and then they're discharged out into the Snake River. Um, so they're used, they run 24 hours a day. Uh, there's no water that's wasted here or used. It just flows in and out and the fish are raised in them. So there's no water that's actually used. It's just used to hold the fish while, while they're being fed. Both of these, the, the springs and the river, are, as I said, precious resources and want to be highly protected. Um, and so, over the years, this is the effluent coming out of one of the trout farms. Over the years, uh, both the federal government, this has been mostly back around the year 2000, the federal government and the Idaho State Department of Environmental Quality imposed extraordinarily strict standards on the pollutants that could come out of trout farms. Um, at the time, they were so strict that it didn't look like, I think most of the trout farmers thought that we will never be able to meet this. We will never be able to meet the standards that are being imposed upon us. Uh, there was a lot of money spent, uh, a lot of USDA funds that went into funding research on modifying the trout diets modifying the way the waste are treated, modifying the way the fish are raised and so forth in order to make these fish much more efficient at retaining the nutrients and discharging a pristine water at the end. And so they were given a limit that was very strict, like I said. And, but through this research, they not only met the limit, but they unbelievably exceeded it by a lot. That top line, these are just in percentages. That top line, rather than putting a pound of phosphorus or something like that there, that's just uh, essentially 100% of what these trout farms were allocated. That was how much phosphorus they could discharge. And those dotted lines are what they're actually discharging. So they not only met these very strict standards, but about 50%, you can see they're discharging far less than what they're, what they're allowed to discharge. And again, um, just a, an amazing, an amazing result based on research and um, uh, what the industry did for themselves. These are just some uh, some summaries. Again, this was a, a very difficult topic uh, because each of these, as, as we've already heard, each of these types of aquaculture has uh, totally different impacts and so forth. But there are some generalities that I think you should know. And then the final two slides are really the only two things you need to know. Uh, first of all, extractive aquaculture, things like seaweeds and mussels and so forth, have a net positive benefit for the environment. They, they take up pollutants, they clean the water up, uh, they dissipate wave energy, and they can protect shorelines, and they're an economic driver in, in the areas where they're raised. Um, this next one is that fish are just inherently, by their nature, an extremely efficient fish to raise. They, they convert feed efficiently. And that has implications for all sorts of resource use, whether it's land, energy, water, greenhouse gases, whatever it might be. They're just very efficient. Oops. And aquaculture is a, uh, just a clean industry, as, I, as these last two examples have shown. I want to make a, a statement, you know, just explain this, this, this thing right under there that says bias nature. Again, I mentioned at the beginning that a lot of my work in the past has been towards working within the culture system. In other words, trying to maintain in the culture system a clean environment so the fish grows well. And that's extremely important, both the trout farmers, catfish farmers, it doesn't matter where you are. The goal is to keep the water clean so that the fish grow well. So. That's just a, just a part of raising fish, is to maintain a good environment 
which then leads to a, 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 an effluent that is, is minimally uh, a problem. And then, as Carol has mentioned, uh, effluents in the United States from all aquaculture facilities are highly regulated. So it's a, it's a clean industry. These next two slides are, are really what I, what I want you to know. And, and the reason this is important is because these are, th this is a quote from Jason Clay with the World Wildlife Fund. The World Wildlife Fund is a pretty strident or, uh, environmental organization. And they've done a lot of work and worked with the cat, not the catfish industry, the aquaculture industry across the world, and have been important for some really significant changes in what aquaculture has done over the years. Um, they made a study a few years ago, and this is on their website, where they looked at sort of the collision course of our resource use in the world and how much re the resources are used by agriculture and the fact that at some point, we're gonna, it's going to be kind of tough. We're using more resources than we can sustain based on the increase in food consumption over years. The numbers don't mean a thing. Uh, the 40% the in the 2050, those are just some numbers they came up with in their modeling. The point is, is only a fool would believe that the, the Earth does not have finite resources, that our resources are limited. And our population is growing, and our food use is changing. And at some point, there's going to be a problem. The, the solution is going, to make, is, going to, is going to be make agriculture, food production in general, more efficient. That's the only way we can move forward. Research, particularly in the United States, has done impressive jobs of increasing resource use efficiency and so forth in, in food production. But according to the World Wildlife Fund, Jason Clay, to return to a balance with nature, we have to make dramatic improvements. And this was his conclusion. No other food production system in the world has made the improvements that aquaculture has. And only aquaculture has proven that these changes are possible, that we can improve to the point where we can meet these standards that are going to be needed to meet the future food uses. So with that, um, uh, if there's a time for any questions, I'll be glad to give it a whirl. So Kirk, you said that the, you said that the leading polluters in the Mississippi study were egg dominated, so it's koi or it's, it's corn, soy, and wheat. As the that, that's, that, that's true at the Snake River Valley. That's probably true in the United States. So as the industry grows, how can they feed their animals without impacting more production of the rural crop that are the highest polluters? Well, again, uh, you, you combine two things and it becomes pretty obvious. That one study by uh, Hallie Froelich that shows that land use will actually decrease if we raise more aquatic animals. That means that land use in general to raise crops could decrease if we raise more aquatic animals. So um, that would be it. In other words, it's sort of an indirect thing. Raising more aquatic animals uses less land to raise the feeds and therefore pollution from these non-point source pollution, non-point sources like row crops, would possibly decrease over time. Thanks. <laughs>